Greetings, stranger, and welcome to the precipice quarter of Absalom. This district is choked with loss and tragedy, poignantly contrasted with the vibrance for which it originally became renowned. Although it is not the smallest of the city's areas, it feels the most empty, having long been deserted by almost everyone wishing to remain a living participant of civilization. The story of the Precipice Quarter is a worthy tale, but I think it is best introduced with an example. So, hop onto the carriage and join me for a tour of the city at the centre of the world's most avoided district. It is for the best that we are exploring the Precipice Quarter as the sun is approaching its zenith, because this area is far more dangerous than even the puddles. It does not look it, I know, with these abandoned homes several steps above the ramshackle slums and upturned boat hulls of the puddles, and even the cramped townhouses of the docks, yet until three years ago I would not have toured here so overtly. In fact, the guards from its neighbouring docks and Eastgate districts block access to the area through all of its roads from dusk until dawn. Or, more accurately, they block exfiltration from anybody or anything trying to leave under the cover of darkness. To see why, well, here is the example I mentioned. Can you see it there, through the rundown houses? That mass of eldritch stone deposited in the middle of the block, looking rather like a meteorite. Yet it is, in fact, the petrified remains of a rackworm, a devastatingly powerful creature spawned from the mind of Rovaguk, the world breaker. The embodiment of destruction is heralded only by the most fearsome and chaotic of servants, and rackworms are no exception. I do not know much about them, but it should be obvious from even this eroding stone that they are no natural phenomenon. This 15-foot-tall slab is actually just its head, which has so far, and somewhat ironically, resisted every effort to unmake it. Well, the question then is what it's doing here. In the earliest days of Absalom, a cultist of Rovaguk summoned the creature here to consume the whole city but it was slain before it made much progress. Unfortunately, killing the rackworm was only the first step. The cult has endured, tiny but real, through every attempt to dislodge it. And the main reason for this is the subtle, psychic call that draws worshippers to the site. You often do not know that you are a cultist of Rovaguk until it is far too late to stop yourself. The Worldbreaker's call is said to be like a plague that infiltrates the soul just as parasites infiltrate the body. It is also said that, at sundown, an onlooker at Racked Rock, as it's called, can glimpse a visage in the petrified flesh, and some speculate it may be more than just a trick of the light. And today, there remains a small congregation of faithful that live in these buildings, they seem compelled to remain to the block, so they have so far been tolerated by their neighbours, but woe betide any who would do harm to what little remains of the rackworm, for the violence of a Rovagog cultist is as gruesome as it is relentless. As we move on and skirt towards the harbour, I hope you can see why I chose Racked Rock as the starting point for the Precipice Quarter as a whole. It is an eclectic and volatile mixture of history, horror, and melancholy. But it was not always so. Until around 20 years ago, this area was called Beldrin's Bluff, and it was an affluent and popular participant in Absalomian life. Known for its high-end shops and restaurants, the district had grown organically around the three-spired residence of the Archmage Beldrin, whose tower had been proudly visible to the hundreds of ships approaching the city by sea each day. With commanding views and a few noble houses throwing their support behind the area, a unique culture emerged. For hundreds of years, it functioned like any other district, with its own council stewarded by its own nomarch and protected by its own guard force. And then, in 4698, a truly massive earthquake shook Absalom. Buildings collapsed, roads cracked open, 
the puddles measurably sank into the ground and thousands died. But nowhere was more acutely affected than Belgrin's Bluff, as large chunks of the cliffs that supported the heart of the district were hurled into the sea and onto the rocks below. In minutes, the district literally collapsed. Recovery may have been possible in a normal city, but Absalom fell victim to its own scale. On the one hand, the locals loved the bluff as their own town, and so its end felt like the end of the whole city, even of the whole world. And on the other hand, the Grand Council had the rest of the city to consider, and the city's resources, while plentiful, were ultimately finite. On a third hand, it emerged in the weeks following the earthquake that the district had fallen victim to several secondary disasters, which we'll come to. For reasons still debated, undead curses manifested across the town, and cultists of an evil persuasion challenged any and all legitimate authority, which had already been weakened considerably. Panic gripped the populace. The Shadow War also pulled strings to ensure that the influence of any surviving noble houses advocating for relief funds was quashed. So, one thing led to another, and a decision was ultimately made. The district was dissolved and quarantined so entirely that it was even renamed to the Precipice Quarter and barred at night. Any souls now had to fend for themselves. Anarchy had somehow become council policy because it was just easier to cut losses than invest in the recovery of a demoralised, impoverished and accursed district. The results are plain to see, and it used to be far worse than this. However, in recent years, two major events shifted things slightly in favour of the area. Firstly, the collapse of the militaristic nation of Last Wall to the north caused its leader, Watcher Lord Ulthun II, and his faithful knights to seek asylum in Absalom. Ever a devotee to law and order, Watcher Lord Ulthan has taken it upon himself to restore the district, and from his headquarters he seeks nothing less than the total rejuvenation of this wretched society. While he has no seat on the low council like the Nomarchs do, he is the closest thing to a leader the Precipice Quarter has at the moment, and that makes his Knights of Last Wall something of a district guard. Their efforts have enabled some daylight surgeons around the major roads to be possible again, which is why this tour can go ahead in such a straightforward way. Secondly, acting Primarch Winsel Starborn made it his personal mission to make the Precipice Quarter habitable again at around the same time. Three years ago, he commissioned a new paramilitary group called the Agents of Edgewatch to assist the Knights of Last War. With a formal remit, from the Primarch himself, no less, the agents have made significant progress. Indeed, their work was instrumental in ensuring that the 4920 Radiant Festival, which was held around here, uh, ran relatively smoothly. The Primarch's message was simple. Bring light and life back to the district. Return the former Belgian's bluff to the fold. Unfortunately, while the efforts of these groups have been nothing less than Herculean, there remains the difficult matter of demography. Because at the end of the day, Absalonians feel no compulsion to migrate across town to a more dangerous part, and immigrants to the city look at its jagged, scarred cliffs with fear, and they are right to do so. After all, there are good reasons that the roads remain closed at night. These blocks to the right support this point. They are inhabited by Mortex, who constitute the majority of the area's population now. Mortex are humanoids who have been infected with necromantic magics and negative energies, and have been subsequently transformed into a ruined mockery of life. While not technically undead, Mortic bodies have been exposed to such overwhelming negative energy that they have fooled themselves into believing that they are, despite the objections of the mind and soul still inhabiting them. Raw meat is the only thing that staves off the putrefaction and decay of their living flesh for most, and the trauma of being in a perpetual state of near-terminal illness has driven many to madness. 
Maltics are a new kind of humanoid, being first recorded just four years ago with the return of the lich Tarb Fon. He wrought havoc in the Gravelands with a magical weapon he dubbed Radiant Fire. In a way, this produced a magical counterpart to certain elements normally buried deep within Galarian that, if brought into contact with the living for too long, cause inexplicable sickness and painful death. With Radiant Fire, Tarbafon ensured that even survivors, and there were not many, would become twisted and dependent on the very energy that destroyed their homes and lives. This cruelty has only been tragically multiplied by the Knights of Last Wall's reaction to this Mortic community, called Morticant. On two separate occasions they have burned blocks of the district down in an attempt to purge the Mortics of their evil ways. And there are many evil practices undertaken in Morticant, make no mistake. Negative energy is, after all, the manifestation of evil in the cosmos, not some misunderstood or misappropriated force. Still, it is unlikely that anyone associated with Morticant will be granted fair treatment by an outsider, to put it mildly. Ah, uh, but here, we have reached the sea again. Look, there, you can see the Flotsam Graveyard in all of its watery glory. Nature has reclaimed this isolated part of the district, with its small parks and green places exploding into vines, weeds, flowers and trees beyond count. But try to look through them, and you might see complex rope and rigging systems lining the cliff face. If you do, do not go near them, for they are only active at night and are rigged to collapse during the day. This area is the Rope Cliffs, and it is the uh, economy's answer to a patch of anarchy in an otherwise tightly controlled border. Smugglers engage in high return climbing and hauling operations here each night to bring into the city whatever goods will pay the prices, which can be steeper than the cliffs themselves. Cursing and screams of unfortunate sailors plummeting to their deaths into the black and cold waters below are more common than you would think. And for the most part, the Knights of Last Wall leave them be, I think due to the goods destinations being out of district. After all, nobody here can afford the costs of this method of importing, except perhaps the Knights themselves. These days, when people approaching the city by sea look up at the cliffs, they see this crumbled tower from its other side. This was the abode of the Archmage Beldrin, whose tower was the envy of architects across the inner sea. Originally, it consisted of three spires that ventured farther and farther over the cliff face, as if challenging gravity to claim them. As you can see, though, only one survived the earthquake and even it remains precarious at the very edge of the surviving land. What you see before you is the Tower of the Broken Shield, named after one of three legendary artefacts Belgian was said to have stored around his residence. The other two lent their names to the Tower of the Horn and the Tower of the Candelabra. The Tower of the Horn fell among the rocks below and is revealed at low tides. Despite its relative ease of access, it is usually considered the more dangerous excursion than its counterparts, because the tidal currents and competing forces of erosion between salt water and sea air lead to rip tides, chemical spills, electrical disturbances, and a host of magical phenomena. Exploration parties need to refresh their maps every few months, and nobody has ever claimed to reach the tower's core. The Tower of the Candelabra, meanwhile, was flung violently into a trench that lies a little further out in the harbour. Sinking too deep for most people to access, reports from the Azakerti community offer tales of a barnacle-encrusted and fish-infiltrated ruin that gives an unusually menacing presence. The Azakerti claim that about once a year, the tower emits a whale-like cry that stirs something primal and terrifying to all life surrounding it. Investigations afterwards report that all life around the tower dies shortly thereafter, and the seabed sands are littered with the bones of those too slow or too foolish not to flee in time. And that leaves this tower before us. 
It is certainly easier to access, but adventurers will quickly find themselves contesting every single room with Mortix, the Undead, Cultists, and Belgian's ancient magical wards and other defences, still active after all these years. Its reputation as the easiest of the three towers has, predictably, led to it becoming the most dangerous and violent. All this treasure hunting has inspired little confidence from the knights, who try to avoid the estate unless a threat warrants immediate intervention. They are more concerned with this fissure in the earth that lies right next to the tower. This is the Bone Glutton Pit, and it is, I am afraid, a horror entirely of Absalom's making. You see, immediately after the earthquake, officials decided that the pressure on the city's corpse and rubble removal channels were too great. Their temporary solution was to take advantage of this particular fissure torn into the ground by the earthquake by using it to bury the dead and dispose of the debris. Well, there is nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. And soon enough, the disrespectful treatment of the dead led to severe consequences as ghouls began to emerge from the charnel pits, channeling their necromantic energies into the creation of tunnels and temples throughout the fissure. The ghouls, in turn, attracted a cult of Urgothoa, the Varesian goddess of the undead. They began making living offerings to the ghouls, which have now attracted the attention of the Knights of Last War. While the cultists will no longer attack passers-by in broad daylight, even the knights dare not venture into the pit below. And I received a report from a reliable source not too long ago that its expansion is accelerating. The worst aspect of this is that there is some evidence that the ghoul's origin is not as mysterious as the official line claims. According to experts of undead lore, ghouls very rarely manifest out of nowhere. They arise mostly through the spread of ghoul fever, a disease they all carry. While other methods exist, piles of corpses are, by themselves, not sufficient to create them. So, one theory claims that a member of the High Council, usually the Chief Sanitation Commissioner, Lorette, but accounts vary, was bribed or coerced into using ghouls as a grisly method of corpse disposal. Ghouls are legendary corpse-eaters, after all. Well, I do not know the truth of these accusations, but I will point out to you the Sanitation Commission's offices that are not too far from here in good time. In the meantime, I want to direct your attention eastwards, back up these crossroads. That dominating temple in the middle of the road is called the Spiral Shrine, and its grounds are consecrated in the name of Phrasma, the goddess of the dead and the lady of graves. Her judgement awaits every mortal soul who travels down the River Styx after death, and this inevitability means that she is a widely respected deity. It is not surprising, then, that her temple in Belgian's Bluff quickly became a bastion of calm grief in the new and bleeding Precipice Quarter. Survivors pooled their money to repair the temple and to hire a private guard force to defend it. Consequently, the Spiral Shrine was just about the only place in the area that could be considered safe before the initiatives of Watcherlord Ulthun II and Winslow Starborn. As Judge of the Dead, Phrasma considers the existence of undead anathema to her religion, and so it is common for her planar scions to become ghost hunters, ghoul hunters, and so on. Uh, and I should clarify that a planar scion is an individual whose ancestry is inexorably tied to a particular location in the outer planes, like uh, tieflings to the lower planes or asamas to the upper planes. Planar scions of the boneyard, which is Phrasma's realm, are called duskwalkers, and they are extremely rare, even among their distant planar kin. Duskwalkers are the reincarnated souls of individuals who have, knowingly or not, followed Phrasma's tenets in a previous life, and have been rebirthed into the material plane by psychopomps to help further this cause again. There can only be a finite number in existence, so if the soul of a Duskwalker is not resurrected within one year of death, the opportunity vanishes beyond the reach of even the mightiest wish or miracle. I have gone on this slight tangent because almost every Duskwalker in Absalom lives on this block, supporting the efforts of the Spiral Shrine. 
They are almost all undead hunters, and were considered the de facto protectors of the Precipice Quarter before the arrival of the Knights, although their numbers are far too small and their purpose far too specialised to have ever been considered a true guard force for the district. We'll be starting north here, but before we move on, uh, I should tell you that taking the westward road will lead you to another mighty fissure opened by the earthquake, this one leading directly to the Darklands. In case you don't know, the Darklands are an enormous series of interconnected caverns and tunnels that riddle the whole of Galarian like a, a hollow sea, and they're filled with creatures and wonders beyond count and imagination. Journeys there offer riches through rare minerals and trade, but they are usually one-way trips for parties who fail to comprehend the dangers posed by such a dark, disorienting environment. Entrances to the Darklands are plentiful, but most are difficult to access. But not this one. Called the Dark Gate, it became known to everyone in Absalom about a decade ago, when a host of destructive creatures swarmed out of it uh, to claim Absalom as their own. In the aftermath of the city's retaliation, an entrepreneurial gang calling themselves the Nail Fists gained control of the site, promising to act as a bulwark for the rest of Absalom. This arrangement proved to be quite profitable for the Nail Fists, who continued to charge extortionate prices to pass through the Dark Gate in either direction. And while they may have started as a simple street gang, today they resemble something more comparable to the First Guard's Eagle Garrison. Members are highly trained and well armed, and do indeed keep their word by slaying the occasional monster that peeks its head onto our surface world. If you want to descend into the darkness below, or leave Absalom by its most inconspicuous route, paying the Dark Gate toll is your answer. This square to our left used to contain the buried, decommissioned golem known as Gulgamod, one of Belgium's ancient defences gifted to the quarter. Some efforts were made to repair it prior to the Radiant Festival a few years ago, but I understand that agents of Edgewatch ultimately decided that it was uh, too great a risk in a district already plagued by powerful threats. I admit I do not know what has happened to Gulgamod, but this next stop signals that the golem might no longer be necessary in any case. Behold Vigil's Hope. I know that compared to many of the other fortresses within Absalom, this rather fragile looking keep may not seem particularly impressive. However, uh, that is because, unlike most of the fortresses here in the city at the centre of the world, Vigil's Hope is very much a working castle. Uh, this site had been ruined and abandoned, even before the earthquake, and the Knights of Lastwall, who now inhabit it, had to withstand near-constant assault by undead and death cultists in order to even repair the walls. Yet now it stands stoic against such forces, and it is a headquarters of which they are justly proud. Of course, the presence of the Knights has not been universally welcomed, even by those who do wish to eradicate the undead menace. Some locals feel that their authority overreaches, um, offering average security in exchange for intolerable intrusions on their freedoms in the Precipice Quarter. Others fear the fallout of yet another major confrontation between, for example, the Knights and the Mortix. As I mentioned, two city blocks have already been raised to the ground. Yet, in general, the Watcher Lord is respected by the communities here for at least trying to alleviate the plight of the Precipice Quarter, something that few others can claim. This next building is the old courthouse for the area, but it was actually closed and boarded before the earthquake, a detail people often misremember. A grave miscarriage of justice took place here, leading to the execution of one Jarbin Maud, whose ghost returned to haunt the building and to terrorise those responsible for his fate. Some whisper that it was Maud's execution that saw the straw to break the camel's back and caused the gods to punish the bluff with their wrath, though such conspiracists usually struggle to explain why similar tragedies have yet to befall other areas of the city. Farther up this road is the Rat Taker's Palace, converted long ago into office space for the famously corrupt City Sanitation Commission. See, I promised they would appear again. 
Indeed, it is my understanding that the palace is actually in use now, uh, following the increased security of the area. Chief Sanitation Commissioner Jarrett was strangely hesitant to evacuate the building in the aftermath of the earthquake, and extremely eager and quick to inhabit it again as soon as it was declared safe enough. There is no doubt in anyone's mind that a whole host of dark secrets could be uncovered by raiding that place, but so far nobody has tried. Jarrett's corruption borders on comical, even by the standards of a High Counselor, yet it has allowed him to retain his role for decades, so any investigators should approach the issue with only the most intense discretion and caution, lest they find themselves thrown into the bone glutton pit and left for the ghouls. This block on our left was once the crown jewel of the district, and one of the most popular tourist destinations in all Absalom. Known as the Arboretum Arcanis, it consists of a single, enormous greenhouse, capped internally with a gemstone tuned with a unique and generous amount of nature magic. Stewarded by its mastermind, a Goran druid named Kea, the Arboretum was a truly unique ecosystem. And I mean that literally, every plant and animal inside was unique to this one block, having been respectfully warped or evolved by the druid's shepherding. When the earthquake shook the city, the greenhouse suffered. Its crowning jewel split in two, with the larger section sent crashing into the life below. This fracturing seemed to reverse all of its enchantments, and a new ecosystem enveloped the flora and fauna unlucky enough to survive the devastation. Now the animals are wretched, violent beasts that refuse to succumb to their innumerable diseases, while the plants are like pathogens to humanoids with razor-sharp vine leaves slicing open veins and infecting hosts with puppeteering diseases. And the fungi? Well, they amalgamate themselves into near-sentient, wandering engines of destruction that care only for their own spread. Kea herself, meanwhile, became the most corrupted of them all, and she is quick to slay anyone who would interfere with her work, and interference for her means entering the greenhouse. It should not be surprising, then, that uh, the knights consider this block to be a priority for the reclamation of the district, but it has so far repelled their efforts. You see, the Arboretum boasts its own weather system that constantly injects the air with acidic particulates of warped water. While barely a tingle at first, spending too long inside the environment for anyone not attuned to its ecology eventually dissolves the body into its mists, if it is not eaten by some horrific, corrupted beast first, of course. And thus far, no armour or magical ward has been able to negate this phenomenon for long enough to justify a serious campaign against Chaos Garden, as it is sometimes also called here. Ah, now, in contrast to the relative success of the Radiant Festival from a few years ago, these buildings and abandoned construction sites around us constitute the Grand Council's first reclamation effort from about 20 years ago, the Grizzly Fair. This was not its intended name, of course. No, it was due to be called the Wonder Fair, an allusion to the remarkably successful Wondervale project in Eastgate that spurred the city's recovery following the death of Eridan. The Grand Council considered the Wonder Fair project another Wondervale, just writ small. It was intended to revitalise and rejuvenate the Precipice Quarter by both inspiring people to immigrate into the area and simultaneously by demonstrating that the dangers of it were exaggerated. Unfortunately, as I hope I have made clear to you by now, the dangers were not exaggerated. Smugglers, cultists, and the undead all worked together to sabotage the fair while it was still under construction, and the Grand Council was forced to abandon the project entirely after several contractors were killed, with their bodies presented in increasingly public and gruesome displays. Following this, the Precipice Quarter did what it does best, and reclaimed the site in its own twisted way. There is a circus here, of sorts. Ghostly acts and eldritch experiences await anybody caught in the area's almost hypnotic attraction. After all, the Grand Council wanted people to stay, so the Grizzly Fair mimics this desire in its own macabre fashion. The acts you can find inside the tents are rarely fatal, 
Rather, they are traumatic mockeries of real performances, undertaken by haunts and ghosts that exist only to prolong the torment of the living. Rumours have begun to spread also of a vampire living somewhere among these buildings, though I have yet to verify this. Right next to the Grizzly Fair is one of the district's most mysterious and dangerous phenomena. You can see the clouds they make, but I think their noise is more difficult to endure. That reclaimed park off to our left is Stinger's Scar, and it is a maelstrom of living, stinging, biting, venomous creatures. From tiny flies to hornets the size of your arm, the Scar's swarms descended upon what was once a high-end amusement park one afternoon in the aftermath of the earthquake, seemingly from nowhere. They quickly drove away every other living thing, and then they began to interbreed. Naturalists and arcanists alike have been at a loss to explain the mechanisms by which giant hornets exchange with stinging crabs, but exchange they did, and continue to do, creating ever larger and more dangerous hordes of uniquely deadly creatures. This raging venomous storm is impartially hostile to everyone, and nobody has claimed any sort of responsibility or even understanding of the phenomenon which has never left the park grounds. However, there are rumours of a figure that dwells in the heart of the scar, humanoid in shape but lacking a face, who spins in endless circles amidst the flies, crying through a mouth that he does not possess that he is the Scorpion Prince. <laughs> a classic bogeyman for children's bedtime stories, I am sure, but there is something to be said about the malice behind the maelstrom. If there is one thing everyone has been able to agree on, it is that Stinger's Skull is no natural occurrence. We are approaching the end of the tour now, but ahead of us yet lies its saddest part. Just beyond the scar, tucked away, overlooking both the docks and the harbour, lies the ruined Tri Towers Yard, now just called the Drown Yard. Originally one of the most affluent and prestigious schools for children in Absalom, the site fell victim to the effluence of a long-forgotten necropolis that was unleashed by the weakening of the school's foundations during the earthquake. Having literally just survived the disaster that claimed so many others along the cliff face, the children and teachers of the school were instantly slain by a powerful and altogether evil curse that accompanied these sewage-like necropolis waters. Yet that was not all the curse did. At once their bodies rose again as monstrous and violent creatures with chubby, clawed fingers and fangs. The Drownyard children still play and study in their flooded school, but they are quick to kill anyone who trespasses. The responsible necropolis has been a high priority for exploration by the Pathfinder Society, who have launched several expeditions with the funding of Lady Dacolin of the Ivy District. You might recall during my tour there that her son, Jay, was found alive against all explanation by Pathfinder agents a full decade after the tragedy, so she has a deeply personal investment in understanding the nature of the curse and of the necropolis that unleashed it. There remains a small, warded patch at the edge of the drown yard that protects against undead and evil creatures. It is an impressive bastion and shrine to the children's souls, but it is also put into sharp relief by the horrific complex that haunts it. And now we have come to our final point of interest. This is Bartafall, the only block inhabited by Absalomians in the whole district. You can see the poverty everywhere. The population here is comparable to the Puddles, in that they do not have the means to leave. Yet even the Puddles residents have a veneer of legitimate authority to guide them, while the anarchic Precipice Quarter offers them nothing but death and disease. The name comes from the local economy. Coins are worthless here, unless they come with goods, because bartering is how these people survive. High on the cliff there is no Azakerti population to supplement trade, and the smugglers gave up their efforts to trade here long ago themselves. Conditions deteriorate year after year, with not even the Radiant Festival making a dent. Justifiably, the residents here feel forgotten and abandoned by all, except perhaps the Knights, whose influence is limited to conducting sweeps for hiding undead. 
I am afraid that, unless conditions significantly improve, and soon, the population here will continue to shrink and succumb to the march of time, and if so, the future of the Precipice Quarter will lie only on its mortic population at the other end of town. Well, there we have it. I am sorry to end this tour on such a sombre note, but it is important to me that I educate you about the people living in the district just as much as I do the buildings that compose it. The Precipice Quarter has a reputation for adventure tourism, and the Primarch's Edgewatch initiative has only intensified this critique. Yet, despite the objective progress in combating the most visible threats to the district, like the undead, the cultists, and the eldritch, it is also important to stress that these have mostly failed to address the district's most insidious dangers, which are poverty, disease, and no formal political representation. At many points in this tour have I referred to some corruption or danger as operating like a plague, and I think that metaphor is appropriate here as well. I fear that the lack of obvious targets has inhibited adventurers' ambitions to combat these latter, subtler plagues. But perhaps that may change in the near future. I certainly hope so, because if it doesn't, then the poor residents of this once great district will be condemned to a slow erasure against the next monster of the week that decides to rear its head in the press of its quarter. I will now be making my way to the coins, the economic centre of Absalom. You will be welcome to join me there if you wish to experience a more normal district. There is no direct connection between here and there though, but I suggest travelling down the street to the docks and then along its first northern road towards the coin's southeastern corner. From there, I will show you how the city at the centre of the world makes its money. Well, until then.